much. Um, thanks for inviting me here. And uh, I must say that I'm very impressed uh, by the work you are doing. Uh, because as the former speaker said, uh, it's not always so easy to identify yourself with uh, people who have been uh, uh, fleeing from their country and who are not accepted anywhere. It's not easy for a country uh, like Norway, for a citizen of a country like Norway to identify himself by itself, herself with this situation. But as uh, the former speaker said, it's about human uh, rights and we are all human beings. And uh, it's important to preserve the empathy. Uh, before I speak about uh, Iran, I would like to add some notes on, uh, on Afghanistan, especially uh, situation of uh, Afghan refugees in Iran, uh, because as I mentioned earlier, we are very concerned about that. Um, it's uh, especially children who are born in Iran, whose uh, mothers are Iranians and fathers are Afghans, because uh, according to Iranian law, uh, Iran only recognizes citizenship by paternal blood. It means that the father has to be Iranian if the child is going to have Iranian citizenship. There are at least 32,000 such marriages in Iran. These are official numbers. The unofficial number is probably much higher. And their children, they do not have Iranian citizenship. It means that they don't get an Iranian ID before they feel 18. They can't go to school. They can't have the, uh, the rights that an Iranian child has, uh, the same uh, health possibilities. And these children, uh, they don't have so many defenders. Uh, UNHCR has given some uh, funding to Iranian authorities in order to use it for their education, but uh, uh, Iranian authorities, they don't do it. They, they don't feel the responsibility for these children. So what we are facing is that there is a new generation of uh, children with Iranian mother and Afghan fathers who are grown up. Uh, uh, they are analphabets uh, and, uh, you know, we get a new class uh, in Iran. Uh, for these people. So I hope in future that these children get also more, more uh, attention. The other thing is that the uh, situation of Afghans in Iran is uh, also serious um, in a way that um, there are many Afghan children who have to work uh, in order to earn money for their families. Sometimes the fathers are deported back to Afghanistan and the mother is there with children and the children have to uh, have some kind of income for the to so that the family can uh, manage to survive. These children could be very young, and again, uh, nobody defends their rights. So, I would say that Afghan uh, refugees in Iran are amongst the weakest uh, groups that we have. Our organization, Iran Human Rights, uh, that I represent today. We monitor human rights abuses in Iran. We try to document, uh, and as uh, also the former speaker said, it is, documentation is very important. As long as we say that situation is very bad, nobody listens to you. But once you have documentation, then they can't deny it. We have been trying to make some documentation also on Afghan uh, people, because uh, our main uh, focus has been the death penalty, and we know that uh, there are many Afghans among those people who are executed in Iran, for, for example, drug trafficking. Um, according to the international law that Iran has ratified, they have to give a notice to the embassy or consul of uh, the foreign country if uh, they want to prosecute or even sentence a foreign citizen. They don't do it, and the Afghan government doesn't ask for it. 
So what we hear is that some Afghan families, they have to go to the Iranian border, pay some money, and get the bodies of their family members who have been executed, and they have to pay for it. So again, the situation is very serious, and uh, we really don't have uh, so much focus on it. What I'm going to talk about today is about human rights violations in Iran. Um, as I said, our organization, Iran Human Rights, is an um, international organization. We have members inside Iran and also in other countries, and uh, we work with documenting human rights abuses. When we talk about human rights violations in Iran, we have to keep in mind that it happens in two ways. It happens in a legal way, meaning that there are laws in Iran that uh, allow human rights violation. For instance, if a woman doesn't uh, cover properly uh, her body or uh, the hair, she can be sentenced to up to 74 lashes. That's written in the law. So that's uh, legal uh, violence against women for, uh, for the way they clothe. Or we have barbaric punishments such as amputations, flogging, these are stated in the law, and that's also human rights abuse according to the law. But we also have human rights violations despite the law, meaning that Iran has ratified several international conventions but they still do not follow these conventions. For instance, torture is not allowed in Iranian prisons, according to the law. You can't get forced confessions in Iran, according to the law. But almost all cases we have studied in the prison, they have been subjected to torture and forced confessions. So, when uh, we talk to the Norwegian um, authorities, we have to keep in mind that, or remind them that Iran is not a democratic country that follows the rule of law. As all corrupt dictatorships, they even break their own law. Only one thing matters, and that's survival of the establishment, and whatever gets into the way will be removed. I was thinking to uh, go through the, our annual report of 2011. It's about the death penalty, but I think it's a good way to demonstrate the uh, situation of the human rights in Iran, so, because we will go through some cases that might be of interest also here. Um, so, in Iran, uh, Iran is one of the countries with the highest number of death penalty after China, but when you compare the um, the population probably is on top of the world when it comes to use of the death penalty. Um, the report that we have uh, gathered uh, is based on mainly on the official Iranian sources, but we have also our own reliable sources, meaning lawyers, family members, and direct witnesses and other NGOs. So, according to our report, last year, uh, at least 676 people were executed in Iran. It's, mm, and beside that, we have uh, uh, information about, about 100 additional executions that we haven't included in this report, meaning that in Iran, two people are executed every day. And uh, as you see from the previous years, the trend has been increasing dramatically, especially after the 2009 election protests. We believe that Iranian authorities use that penalty as a mean to spread fear among the people. It's not a way to fight crimes, but it's a, a way to spread fear. Um, as I say, two people every day. If you just look at the last 10 days, 24 people have been executed. Uh, three people were ex executed yesterday. Uh, one was executed the day before, and so on. And today, I'm sure that we, we, we have executions as well. So every day, we have to read about these executions. But again, it's very important to document, because one day we hope that uh, 
Iranian authorities, they will uh, be kept accountable for what they are doing. When it comes to the public executions, we have also seen a dramatic increase in public executions. If we just look in the past three years, uh, last year we had about three times or more than three, uh, uh, three times more exec public executions than the year before. And so far this year we have about two, 20 public executions, the same as the whole year 2010. Again, it shows that uh, the Iranian authority have increased number of executions and public executions are meant to spread fear. Um, this is a picture from, uh, I'm not going to show so many such pictures. This is a picture from uh, Khomeini Shah, October 2011. A child uh, watching execution of uh, three men. Um, later I read also an interview of, um, between an Iranian uh, news agency and a, and a father who had been driving uh, two hours to bring his uh, seven-year-old uh, child to see the public executions. Iranian authorities encourage this. They say that watching a public execution actually gives a lesson to tomorrow's generation so that they don't break the law. But what they actually are doing, they are trying to adopt the people, also the next generation, to this kind of punishments. Because when a population sees a public execution as a normal punishment, it doesn't react to it. They want to make it as a natural part of the culture. And that's also what we are trying to counteract, and that's what we ask the Western governments to react every single time they hear about executions, uh, even though it happens every day, because even a symbolic reaction is important because when you see something wrong, you have to do something about it. If you are quiet, it could be understood as a green signal to what is happening. So, who are these people who are executed? According to official charges, more than 70% of these people are sentenced to death for drug-related crimes. So drug trafficking is the biggest group of the official executions. Last year, we had about 13% rape, 7% murder, and then we had uh, a case of sodomy, uh, homosexual sex between two men. That was one of the rare cases where Iranian authorities executed someone only for having same sex uh, uh, or, or sex between the, uh, um, between the men. We had also execution for apostasy that I will come back to. These are the official charges, but also according to unofficial charges, that is, the unofficial executions, again, drug trafficking is the biggest group. So the question is, who are these people who are sentenced to death and executed for drug trafficking? Only 9% of these people are identified by the first and last name. So we don't know anything about 91% of these people who are executed charged for drug trafficking, meaning they could be anyone. All these trials are taking place at a revolutionary course behind the closed doors. And we have many reports of unfair trials. We know that there are uh, both Iranian and foreign citizens among them, many Afghans, Last week, I think three Afghans were executed. Their identities were not, uh, were not announced, but we have found it through our own sources. But we have also examples of uh, people who were not involved, probably, possibly, in the drug uh, trafficking. Uh, Zahra Bahrami, this is a Dutch citizen. She was arrested at a protest in 2009, December 2009. And uh, she was sentenced to death 
for um, what they call muharebe, meaning waging war against the God, meaning that you are against the regime. But then uh, this case uh, got lots of attention. In January 28, 2011, she was hanged, convicted of drug trafficking. After a few months, the Iranian authorities say that we have found uh, several kilos of cocaine at her place. Um, it is very likely that what they say is not true. But what is the reason why so many people are executed for drug trafficking is because it's more acceptable in the world. You know, the world community doesn't react so much when they execute people for drug trafficking. Uh, and we also know that United Nations and European Union, they cooperate with Iran when it comes to fighting drug trafficking from Afghanistan to uh, Europe. So Iranian authorities say that we are actually helping you by fighting drug trafficking and by executing them. We have asked the United Nations to either stop any cooperation that might lead to execution of people when it comes to their cooperation uh, with regards to uh, fighting drug trafficking. There should be, I mean, it's not a dilemma. Uh, you, you stop drug trafficking by killing them. I think right to life is much more important also according to international rules. So I hope that also Norwegian authorities uh, follow this up. We cannot cooperate with the regime that executes, I would say, indiscriminately people for drug trafficking. Another example of people uh, who were executed for drug trafficking is uh, Leila Hayati. This is a picture by a cell phone from the prison. She was executed in um, October 2011. A lone mother of a 10-year-old boy, uh, what she had done was to introduce one person who wanted to buy drugs to someone who was selling. She was arrested along with five people. She was sentenced to death for selling and buying seven kilos of heroin. She denied these charges all the time, and she said, I have never had this kind of money. She was very poor. But she was executed uh, in October. Along with her, three other, uh, two other women and two men were ex uh, arrested and they were executed a few weeks later. Huriyet, a long mother of five children, one of them was, uh, uh, she, she, uh, I think he had uh, Down syndrome, I think, if I don't mistake. But again, a long mother, very poor. They were so poor that the family couldn't afford the expenses, expenses of her funeral. She was executed, charged with, uh, um, you know, being member of a big uh, narcotic uh, league. So we believe that there are many such examples among these several hundred people who have been executed for drug trafficking. These are among the weakest people in the Iranian society. Nobody defends them. They don't have contacts in the media. They don't have contacts in the civil society. And they are completely um, unknown to the world. We get to know them once they are executed. I told you about the execution for homosexuality, sodomy. In September 5, three men were executed. This has been one of the issues that we have been uh, discussing with the Norwegian authorities and also European authorities because uh, they say that homosexuals are not in danger in Iran. We have had difficulties proving it because in most of the cases, when they execute someone for homosexual acts, uh, they use uh, the same paragraph as they use for rape. So it has been very difficult for us to document that homosexuals are executed actually in Iran. But this year, according to official Iranians, I think it was the chief prosecutor of this city who said that these three people were ex sentenced to death for immoral acts based on Articles 108 and 110 of the Penal Code. 
when we read these articles, the, these articles are about, one of them explains what sodomy is, that is sexual intercourse between men. The other one says that the sentence is death penalty. That's it. There is no mention of rape or anything else. So we have clear proof that people can be executed for homosexuality in Iran. Actually, according to the new law, there is a new penal code that has been approved by the Iranian authorities in January. They have made some changes about uh, the sentence for homosexuality. This is the text, the new text. Punishment for homosexuality is flogging or death under the new penal code. Article 233 of the Iranian penal code says, when it comes to the sexual intercourse between men, the person who played an active role in, will be flogged 100 times if the sex was consensual and he was not married but the one who played the passive role will be sentenced to death regardless. So here there is no doubt that uh, it's not about rape, it's about sexual intercourse. But of course, if the active part is non-Muslim, both of them will be executed. Otherwise, and, and also another thing, for the first time, Iranian uh, penal code uses the term homosexual acts for men. Before, they used this term homosexual acts only for women, but they used only sodomy for men. This year, they use homosexual acts. Anything except intercourse will be punished with 31 to 99 lashes. So, according to the law, homosexuals will be persecuted in Iran. We have also executions for political reasons. Muharraba, as I mentioned, it's waging war against God that's been used for people who um, originally, who used to fight against the regime, uh, who were involved in armed struggle. Those who were executed for Muharraba last year, none of them were involved in armed struggles. These two, uh, they were sentenced to death for their connection with Mujahideen a half organization, MKO, what they had been doing was to sending photos and emails to this organization, and they had family members who belonged to this organization. So they were not themselves involved. We have the same for some Kurdish uh, prisoners who were executed, also with the same uh, charge, Muharebe, and uh, again, they have denied involvement in armed struggle, but still executed. Execution of minors, we had at least six people executed. Four crimes or offenses allegedly committed when they were under 18 years of uh, years, uh, age. This is uh, Ali Reza Mullah Sultani. He was 17 years old when he was hanged in public in a place close to Tehran, September 21. According to the news agency, he was so scared that he could barely stand on his feet. So he, he, the, the, the executioner had to help him up several times. He was crying loudly, asking for his mother, asking for forgiveness, and he was hanged. Iranian authorities say that uh, they have stopped executing minors in the new law. That's completely lie. According to the new law, if someone is between 15 and 18 years and commits a crime that is, according to Iranian law, sentenced to death, it's up to the judge to decide whether the person is mature enough to be executed or not. Again, it's like before. Also before, it was up to the judge. It, it's up to the judge now uh, uh, as well. Yesterday, we read the news that Iranian Supreme Court has sentenced a 17-year-old boy to death. So it's still happening. 
and we have secret executions, unannounced executions. Last year we could document secret executions in 15 prisons. We think the real number is much higher. So this is about the report. When it comes to the human rights, the weakest uh, groups, or what I would say the most important groups in Iran, they are women, ethnic mi minorities, you know, Arab, Kurds, Azari, Baluchis. In the past days, we have heard about uh, arrests of many uh, Ahwazi Arabs uh, who have been uh, demonstrating. Minorities and women are exposed to the same human rights violations as the, let's say, Persian men, but they are also exposed to discrimination and lawlessness, which is much more among the minorities. And we know that in Iran we have gender apartheid, so a woman is much weaker in the Iranian judiciary because, for example, a woman's testimony is worth half of a man's. This by itself gives them uh, much uh, fewer rights. And also religious minorities. I will, at the end, yeah, well, women, we do have, they are being persecuted for the way they dress, who they interfere with, according to Iranian law, uh, a man can have up to four wives if a woman who is married is caught uh, for having immoral relation with another man, she can be sentenced to death. In the previous law, it was written stoning. In the new law, they say sentenced to death, but they give the judge um, the right to look into Sharia to find an uh, um, appropriate sentence. So, Stoning is still possible according to the Iranian law. This is an Iranian teenager, this is a private photo, who was uh, lashed, I think, 34 or 35 times because her uncle were um, visible. She sat in a park. And I think that based, uh, I mean, this is something that uh, I think many countries do not recognize. This is gender apartheid. This is human rights violation based on the gender. I think in the 1970s or 80s, if someone of color came from South Africa, it wouldn't be so difficult to give asylum to that person in Norway. But when a woman escaped from Iran and said that actually I am in danger because uh, I couldn't get divorced and uh, my husband was uh, uh, abusing me and if I am sent back I might get killed. It is very difficult to get support for that now. But hopefully it is going the right way. Yusef Nadar Khan is sentenced to death for apostasy. He converted to Christianity after he was, eight, uh, I think it was when he was 19 years old. And this is uh, from the Supreme Court where it is written explicitly that he was sentenced to death for, for, being, uh, for converting from Islam to Christianity. He is in danger of execution. According to the new law, it is easier for Iranian judges to sentence people who convert from Islam to Christianity because it is written explicitly that if the judge doesn't find a crime or a sentence in the penal code, he is obliged to look in Sharia for the sentence. And according to Sharia, to convert from Christ Islam should be sentenced by death. And finally, Zanyar and Luqman Muradi, two Kurdish citizens, sentenced to death for waging war against God. They were sentenced for killing son of uh, uh, a regime official. They confessed, this is the uh, 
from their confessions on the TV, Iranian TV. Later, they have written that they were tortured, they were uh, tied on a bed, uh, they were crucified on a bed, and eaten, uh, uh, beaten in uh, all the body parts. Uh, Zanyar has uh, had blood in his urine still because of the injuries. Um, and uh, they were threatened to be raped. That was one of the main reasons why they confessed. And threatening to rape for the male prisoners is very common in Iran. Uh, according to the documentation that we have, almost all male prisoners that we have interviewed, they have been threatened to rape. That's a method that Iranian authorities use, and it has also been mentioned. This case was mentioned in uh, Ahmad Shahid, uh, the special reporter of United Nations on human rights in Iran. He also mentioned it in his reports. And finally, I would like to pay some attention to Saeed Malikpur. He was arrested, he is a Canadian resident, arrested in Iran in 2008 for developing a software that can be used to upload pictures on the websites. And this software has been used by an adult website. He was also forced to confess that he was running this website and according to new Iranian laws after 2010, uh, some internet crimes can be sentenced to death. Um, so he is sentenced to death and could be executed at any moment. So I think I can stop here and uh, if you have any questions, I would be glad to answer.